Well, good morning, Tri-Valley Church. Please stand and sing with us. Praise the Lord, ye heavens adore him. Praise him, angels in the high. Son of the rejoice before him. Praise him, all ye stars of light. Holy light. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord, for he has spoken. World is mighty voice obeyed. Laws which never shall be which broken. Never shall be broken. He hath made Hallelujah, Amen, Hallelujah, Amen, Amen, Amen. Praise the Lord, for He is glorious. Never shall His promise fail. God has made the saints victorious. Saints victorious. Sin and death shall not prevail. Death shall not prevail. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 Praise the God of our salvation. Most on high his power proclaim. Lord, and magnify his, magnify his name. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 Be seated. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly hosts. Praise the Father, Son. Psalm 16, 1 through 11. Keep me safe, my God, for in you I take refuge. I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. Apart from you, I have no good thing. I say of the holy people who are in the land, they are the noble ones in whom is all my delight. Those who run after other gods will suffer more and more. I will not pour out libations of blood to such gods or take up their names on my lips. Lord, you alone are my portion and my cup. You make my lot secure. The boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Surely I have a delightful inheritance. I will praise the Lord who counsels me. Even at night my heart instructs me. I keep my eyes always on the Lord. With him at my right hand I will not be shaken. Therefore my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will rest secure. Because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead, 
nor will you let your faithful one see decay. You make known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence, with eternal pleasures at your right hand. Please join me in prayer. Oh God, you are awesome. You are wonderful. We love you and we are worshiping you. God, you have saved us, you've created us, you love us, and you are worthy of our praise. God, we ask you to direct our paths. We offer you our lives. We offer you our service. And we ask that you would show us, those around us, um, in our lives that need your care, that need to know your love, and help us to be your hands and your feet as we are your ambassadors to the world. And God, we see evidence all around us that the sins of people have ruined your wonderful creation, and our sins are those among them. God, we ask for your forgiveness when we sin. We need the blood that Jesus shed to wash us clean. God, thank you for sending Jesus to be that sacrifice, to take the punishment for our misdeeds. God, thank you for that, and we praise you for that. And God, we ask um, as we um, as we worship that you would accept our worship, um, and God, you're amazing. We thank you. We thank you for all that you've done for us, and we praise you. God, help us to worship our whole hearts. I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're glad you're here this morning. Uh, Jacob and Tom are going to um, pass out um, some candy. And there is sugar, free candy, and loaded with sugar candy. Take your pick, um, but you should all have a piece of candy, and you should hold on to your candy and not eat it yet. You know what the scriptures say, that if you eat before everybody else is ready. (laughs) Wes got that. (laughs) So grab a piece of sugar candy or sugar-free candy and hold it. Oh. 
It's been a while since we've sung this next song, The Lord's My Shepherd, the 23rd Psalm. Think about these words as we sing them this morning. The Lord's my shepherd, I'll not want. He makes me down to lie in pastures green. He leadeth me in pastures green. Isn't it great to know we're going to a home that's been prepared for us? And we're not going to have any honeydews to do, <laughs> no repairs to make, streets of gold, all the things we read about heaven. And um, until we're there, we have a shepherd who's going to lead us to quiet waters. He's going to restore us. He loves on us more than we deserve. Amen? But he's gracious and he's merciful. So we will extol him. The psalmist says this, I will extol the Lord at all times. His, His praise will always be on my lips. I will glorify in the Lord. Let the afflicted hear and rejoice. Glorify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord, 
and he answered me. He delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to him are radiant. Their faces are never covered with shame. This poor man called, and the Lord heard him. He saved him out of all of his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him, and he delivers them. Now's the time. Take your piece of candy. Take your piece of candy and join with me in taking a bite. Eat it all. Mm. The psalmist goes on to say this. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. Fear the Lord, you his holy people, for those who fear him lack nothing. The lions may grow weak and hungry, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. Come, my children, listen to me. I will teach you the fear of the Lord. Whoever of you loves life and desires to see many good days, keep your tongue from evil and your lips from telling lies. Turn from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Who has held the oceans in his hands? Who has numbered every grain of sand? Kings and nations tremble at his voice. All creation rises to rejoice. Who has given counsel to the Lord? Who can question any of his words? Who can teach the one who knows all things? Who can fathom all his wondrous deeds? Behold our God, seated on his throne. Come, let us adore him. Behold our King, nothing can compare. Come, let us adore Peace. 
us adore him. Behold our King, nothing can compare. Come, let us adore him. Behold our God, seated on his throne. Sing out, church. Come, let us adore him. Adore him right now. Behold our King, nothing can compare. Come, let us adore Him. Amen. 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 Behold our God, seated on His throne. We've come to adore Him, praise Him, worship Him, and let's do it joyfully. Amen. Stand as we sing this next song. I know we don't normally stand at this time, but uh, let's do that. Joyful, joyful, we adore thee, God of glory, Lord of love. Hearts unfold like flowers before thee, opening to the sun above. Melt the clouds of sin and sadness, drive the dark of doubt away. Giver of immortal gladness, fill us with the light of day. Mortals, join the mighty chorus which the morning stars began. Father, love is reigning o'er us. Brother, love binds man to man. Ever singing, march we onward, victors in the midst of strife. Joyful music leads us onward in the triumph song of life. Be seated, please. Morning, church. So the passage we're about to read today is taking place just a couple of days <clears throat> prior to Passover. And the Jewish leaders were plotting a way to secretly arrest and kill Jesus. Mark 14, 3 through 9. While he was in Bethany, reclining at the table in the home of Simon the leper, a woman came with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume made of pure nard. She broke the jar and poured the perfume on his head. Some of those present were saying indignantly to one another, Why this waste of perfume? It could have been sold for more than a year's wages and the money given to the poor. And they rebuked her harshly. Leave her alone, said Jesus. Why are you bothering her? She has done a beautiful thing to me. The poor you will always have with you, and you can help them anytime you want. But you will not always have me. She did what she could. She poured perfume on my body beforehand to prepare for my burial. Truly, I tell you, Wherever the gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. So we've done this before in the past. Turn to the people near you and take a few minutes to talk about this together. And I think the questions are up here. What does the scripture say about God? 
and what does it tell us about people and how we should be living? Test, test. There we go. The word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword, right? Word of God is powerful. And when we commune together, when we contemplate together the word of God, it can bring out some powerful things. Anybody want to share anything that they talked amongst themselves with the whole group? Go for it. Hey, Kelly. Um, you can read that story over and over and know what it says about kneeling 
of feet and washing. And we take that as like, wow, that's a really great thing. But there's something even more underlying behind it that I discovered when you guys were reading it. And I was like, wow, I've known that a long time. Give God your best. But Jesus is repeating back that in the future, everybody will honor her and remember for what she did, which says, well, how would she be honored and remembered unless it was written? So he knew back then before the Holy Bible was even put together that it was going to be put together. So when you run across people that try to refute, oh, it's just a bunch of books. It's just a bunch of this. Well, how do you know that the Apocrypha doesn't go here? How do you know this doesn't go here? Everything in there is God ordained, and he said it beforehand, before it ever even came to pass. And that scripture I got from you just reading. So every day he gives you something new. It's pretty neat. I love this church. Very good. Very good. Cool. Anyone else? All right. So today, let's pray for the bread, which represents his body on the cross, and for the juice, which represents the blood that he shed. Will you join me in prayer? <clears throat> Father God, Holy Spirit, and Jesus, we thank you, Lord, for all the things that you have done for us, and especially this morning as we remember that time on the cross. Lord, when your body was broken and your blood was shed, and it was all for us to draw us closer to you, to tear the curtain that separated us from God from your power. And so we thank you, Lord, for this, these symbols that represent Jesus' body and blood. We ask you, Lord, that as we take them, help us to remember the things that can still separate us from you, the sin in our lives and the things that we do that, that push us apart. We pray, Lord, that you help us to take this moment to remember that you've made a way where there was no way. In Jesus' name, amen. Yo, King Jesus. <clears throat> At this time, we also mention something else that is a part of our worship, which is giving. And it is an act of worship for us to give a part of ourselves, to give our money, to give our time, to give our hearts, are all acts of worship. And there are three different ways, of course, that you can give. You can give online. You can give in person, or you can mail a check. But the point is <clears throat> to give. Because when we do that, we're really just reflecting God. God is a giver. And so therefore, if we're going to be like him, we should also give. Let's pray. Father God, we take this moment in our worship service to remember that giving is an act of worship. We thank you, Lord, for this opportunity whether we've done it already, whether we're about to do it, or whether we're doing it right now. We pray, Lord, that your <clears throat> peace would, would infuse us, that you would help us to understand that this is a gift we give back to you, not because you need it, <clears throat> but because it changes our hearts when we do. We grow a little bit more closer to you, Lord, when we act like you. We thank you for this opportunity to once again Act like Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen.
At this time, we want to dismiss our children to go to kids' worship. We have a program specifically designed for kids ages 4 through 5th grade over in the Family Life Center. They are welcome to go there now. Thank you to our, our teachers who volunteer their time to teach these kids about Jesus. They're going through the Bible. They're going through Acts right now. So these amazing stories of God's Holy Spirit at work and how the church got started. And if you have a child that's under the age of four, you can take them to the nursery that's here in this building, just across from the restrooms, which are on that side of the, of the building. And then the rest of you guys, you're in here. And I wonder if the kids are sad about leaving because they're like, there's candy in this sermon. Uh, you guys got candy today. That was pretty cool. Um, I want you guys to just take a moment. I know you chatted with the people around you, but I want you to have a brief conversation on this topic. Do you prefer... Coffee or tea? Those are your prompts. Turn to somebody next to you, spend about 30 seconds only talking about that. Go, coffee or tea? Folks online, you can weigh in too. Do you, want, do you like coffee? Do you like tea? I like coffee, for the record, in case you're wondering. Wade and Sylvia, coffee. That's the right answer. Marsha, I enjoy them both. You got to decide <laughs> which is the best. It's okay to like both. Rod, coffee or tea? Coffee. Good. You can stay. Hank, coffee or tea? Tea? All right. Close, but no cigar. Brittany, coffee or tea? You have a coffee shirt on. Espresso Rosetta right here in Livermore. Representing the coffee crowd. Raise your hand if you're a coffee person. Raise your hand if you're a tea person. Raise your hand if you tried to come up with a third option and be like, well, you know, blah, 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 blah. All right. Fair enough. There's no wrong answer to this. I just want you to think about what's in your cup when you take a moment to savor, when you take a moment to go, hmm, this is nice. This is just a, a little bit of bliss in my day. We're going to get back to that idea in a minute, but I wanted to start with a story, true story from when I was a teenager. At some point in my church, there was no youth minister, and there was a lot of parent-led leadership in the youth group gatherings, like on our Wednesday night Bible studies, devotional gatherings. And there was also a lot of student-led devotionals, Bible lessons. It was, you know, one student would take the lead on a Wednesday night and present the lesson, and they would plan it out, and they would speak, and they would do discussion questions, and you were responsible for that one-hour gathering. It was good. It was a great opportunity for young people to take some leadership and do some, some grown-up things. I was one of those students, but the one that stood out to me the most was a Wednesday night that was prepared by my friend, Rich Dog. Rich Dog was new to the church. He did not grow up in church, so, you know, he was a little bit rough around the edges. He was kind of a wild man. I asked me some time to tell you some Rich Dog stories, and I'll be smiling like I am now, remembering him. You might even just be able to tell what kind of personality this student had by his name, Rich Dog. That's what we called him. Great guy. It was his turn to do the devotional on Wednesday night. We all gathered. There was probably like 40 students in our youth group at the time. We gathered into the youth space where there's couches and just the space that the church said, this is where the teens can gather on Wednesday nights. Rich Dog showed up with a boom box and a bag of Doritos and a two liter bottle of Diet Pepsi. And it was time to start. And Rich Dog said, listen, being in Christ is supposed to be fun. It's supposed to be a celebration. It's like a party. So that's what we're going to do tonight. We're going to party. And he hit play on the boombox. Music started. We were, I guess it was assumed that we were supposed to all share one bag of Doritos <laughs> and one two liter. It didn't seem like enough uh, of a snack. But that was Rich Dog's lesson. And uh, for, I mean, it took about 30 seconds for him to teach his lesson, teach, I guess, in quotes. And then the rest of the time was fellowship. It was a party. It was us supposed to be appreciating and enjoying 
what it means to be free in Christ, to bask in the love of Jesus, to enjoy Christian fellowship. That's what Rich Dog had prepared for us that evening. And there were two kinds of responses to Rich Dog's devotional. On the one side, there were the people that went, yes, this is awesome. This is the best Bible study I've ever been to. Handful of Doritos. Quite a few students that reacted that way. But on the other side, there were some students whose response was, really? This is what I drove all the way out here for? There was an attitude that said, when I come to Wednesday night youth group Bible study, maybe there should be some Bible involved. Usually we sing songs. There weren't any songs. Usually I learn something or I discuss something or my mind is directed to Christ in a specific way. This is not Wednesday night youth group Bible study. Even from, you might be surprised to hear that from teenagers. You might have assumed that all the teenagers were in this camp. Yes, this is awesome. Crank up the music. Pass the Diet Pepsi. But there was a lot of grumblers. There was a lot of people that were angry about the fact that they had an expectation for what was going to happen, and Rich Dog did not meet those expectations. I bring this up because the verse that we just heard, while we were gathering around the communion table, we are reminded that in the ministry of Jesus, there were a lot of grumblers. There were a lot of arms crossed, this doesn't cut it, this isn't it crowd who were constantly criticizing Jesus for the way he tried to point people to God. In the story that we heard about this woman who comes and anoints Jesus with this expensive perfume. Did you notice? They said, if you could sell that, you could have made how much money? A year's wages. I read recently that the average household income in the city of Livermore is like $106,000 a year. I know. Some of you might be like, nah, that's not me, but uh, dual incomes and average considered. Could you imagine somebody coming to anyone, but even Jesus, and taking something that's worth $106,000 and going, oh, now you smell nice. You might be with the grumblers in the grumbling camp going, that was extravagant. That was a waste. That was not worth it. That's not what we expect. And they said that you noticed in the story, they did what nowadays we refer to as virtue signaling. You know what we could have done? Jesus, I hope you're hearing this because this shows that I'm in tune with what ought to have happened. Could have sold it. Could have given money to the poor. Could have done so much more. This woman is way off base like rich dog. She doesn't get us and how we do things. Someone needs to straighten her out. What is she even doing at this gathering in the first place? Right, Jesus? And they're expecting him to say, oh, yeah. Maybe he does it in a kinder way than they did, but they expected him to say, yeah, it really is a waste. It's really not how we do things. But the response of Jesus instead is, leave her alone. She did something amazing. Of course, Jesus is thinking about the cross. He's thinking about the tomb. We know that this is the anointing of his body, preparing it for burial. It has greater significance. Maybe the disciples weren't thinking about that, but they weren't thinking about the value of what this person was bringing to the table. They only wanted to grumble. They only wanted to say, this isn't how I expect things to go. Today, as we continue on in our series, The Liturgy of the Ordinary, and we draw our attention to God in the ordinary moments of our lives, like losing our keys or brushing our teeth, or what did we talk about last week? Was it? Calling a friend, being in touch with one another, reminding us that we're the body of Christ. I said that because I actually forgot. I didn't remember what it was for a moment. Julia said making the bed. That was one of those from earlier as well. We're going to be talking about drinking tea. Or for some of us, coffee. Or for some of you, a third beverage <laughs> that I didn't give you the option of. And we're going to be thinking about pleasure. And we're going to be acknowledging that pleasure comes from God, that God gave us the ability to enjoy things. God gave us our five senses. He created us to 
enjoy. You know, he created things and said, this is good, this is good, this is good. Look at the sun, look at the stars, look at the plants, look at how it all works together. Look at humans, look at how they work together. This is a very, very good thing that I've done. The woman brought expensive ointment, good, sweet-smelling oil to put on Jesus' body. That's a good thing. God gave us the ability to appreciate that. But sometimes we put pleasure in its wrong place. Much like there were two strong reactions to Rich Dog's devotional that night that I described for you, there's often two extremes that we can take, extreme positions when it comes to pleasure. When you think about pleasure and the things that we enjoy and living our lives and the expensive perfumes or the sweet chocolates that remind us, hey, taste and see that the Lord is good. One extreme people go to is to say, yes, this is awesome. This is my favorite. This smells good. This feels good. This is fun. I don't care how much it costs. I want to do it every day. And it can lead to words you might be familiar with, like hedonism, uh, libertine philosophy, uh, extremes, and then even addictions, and just taking the pleasure and running with it and saying, I'm going to chase this for as long as I can, because this is what life is about. That's an extreme. I don't think that's a healthy position. But on the other side, we have folks who say, mm -mm, pleasure is dangerous because of those reasons. We need to minimize it. We need to avoid it. And especially when it comes to our relationship with God and what God wants for our lives, we need to be very, very minimal and very, very cautious and careful. Those are extremes. The thing about extremes is it's like an idea that there's truth in that goes too far. And so you might have heard this one and go, That's, I kind of lean that way. I could see that. I've known someone who went too far in the other direction. I've experienced addiction. I've experienced the destructive, sinful power of what taking something that's good and making an idol out of it or taking it out of its proper context can do. Maybe I'm close with somebody who's been in that situation. Maybe I have personal experience with that. There's also truth to God made us. God wants us to enjoy life and not notice the things that he has given us to appreciate. But maybe we've been chastised by someone in the past. Maybe we've experienced this, a church that has said, this is, everything's got to be serious. There's nothing wrong with being serious. There's nothing wrong with being reverent. But if we miss what God has given us as a way to connect with him, then maybe... We need to hear the message Jesus said to his followers. Leave her alone. She has done a beautiful thing. What she has done will be spoken about her, will be written about her. This moment, this extravagant gesture will be remembered. Paul says in Philippians chapter 2, uh, chapter 3, join together in following my example, brothers and sisters. Just as you have us as a model, keep your eyes on those who live as we do. For I have often told you before, and now I tell you again, even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross. Their destiny is destruction. Their God is their stomach. Their glory is in their shame. Their mind is set on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven. And we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. It's a caution. It's uh, putting things in perspective and saying, pleasure, yes, but don't take it too far. But don't miss it at the same time. Paul struggled a lot with the early church and getting them to live in a Christ-like way. There was a lot of hedonism. There was a lot of pleasure chasing. Wednesday night uh, in the month of March, Lisa and I are leading our teens through a series on uh, sex and understanding sex from a biblical perspective. God designed sex. It's supposed to be good, but in a certain context, experiencing it in a certain way that's going to lead to life and joy and peace and not shame and destruction and brokenness. And this comes from Paul. Our main text is from 1 Corinthians chapter 6, where Paul takes a group of people who have found Christ and said, okay, I'm in Jesus now. What does that mean? Well, society is still very libertine when it comes to what we do with our bodies. 
They would go and visit temple prostitutes regularly. Now, you might be like, you had a conversation with someone today. What'd you do this weekend? Oh, I visited the temple prostitutes, you know, like you do. You would go, what? Might shock you a little bit. It wouldn't have shocked them. That's just something that you do. And Paul says, actually, that's not what you do. Let me give you some advice. Let me kind of reframe what sex is supposed to be in your life. And he does this with wealth, and he does this with eating. We gathered around the communion table, and Greg made a reference to this earlier in 1 Corinthians chapter. Why am I talking so much about 1 Corinthians? We're, I'm teaching about this next quarter. I'm kind of previewing it. I'm excited for digging in. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, you have that passage that a lot of us have heard most of our lives around the communion table. Anyone who eats or drinks in an unworthy manner in, in the context of communion, eats or drinks judgment upon themselves. Wait for one another. Don't dishonor each other. We forget that the context was the church gathering together for a meal and the wealthy were showing up early and eating all the potluck food and drinking all the wine and even getting drunk and being like, isn't it great being in Christ? And the problem what didn't seem to be the, uh, the eating, the pleasure side of it. It seemed to be the fact that you weren't waiting for the others. There's people who couldn't show up as early as you could. Maybe the laborers who had to come. Paul's like, you're all one in Christ now. You have to be together. You have to wait for one another. I've, I've grown up in the Church of Christ my whole life, and I've heard people at the table say, like, make sure you don't drink the juice and take the cracker in an unworthy manner. It was taught to me that that means you got to focus on Jesus. If you're not picturing the cross and his broken body or something like that, then if you're thinking about your to-do list or something you have to do, then that's the unworthy manner. But what Paul is talking about in 1 Corinthians is it's about the community. It's about doing it in community and showing that love for one another. Remember we talked about this last week. It all comes back to, are we showing love? I feel like this is a little bit of a tangent. But Paul is putting pleasure in its proper context. He's not saying get rid of it altogether. He's saying this is what it means to experience the joys that God gave us the capacity to experience. Some theologians even say one of the evidences for God, one of the ways we know that there can be a God is this capacity we have. Every single person, whether you believe in God or not, we have this ability to appreciate art and beauty and order. And we see a sunset and we go, wow, that does something to us. However you want to go, you could explain it, all oh, the rotation of the sun and the earth and the light refraction and all this. That's fine. Or just the, oh, man, I got to stop and look at this. I was a student at Pepperdine one time, which is right on the ocean, and uh, I remember one time walking from class to the cafeteria, and I'm, I'm just kind of walking along, and I realized every single person in the courtyard is frozen. It was the weirdest thing. It was just like someone hit pause uh, on a video, and everybody was just like stopped where they were. And I'm walking, and go like, why is everybody stopped? And it's because from that angle between the buildings, there was the ocean, and there was the sunset, and there was the, the light and the colors in the sky, and everybody, without coordinating it or organizing it just had stopped and gone like oh and for a moment maybe half a minute we all just kind of went okay that's something it hit us in a certain way music can do this to us visual art architecture landscaping when we when we see a lawn that's beautifully manicured and symmetrical and and it looks like somebody put a lot of thought and care to cultivate this, to take the, the, the disorder, the, just the growth and the, cha and the chaos, which is beautiful by itself, and goes, ah, now here's a path, and here's a, here's a boundary, and here's a line. We can look at that and go, yes. People say that's an evidence for the fact that we have a creator. We have an organizer. We have a divine cultivator that has given us this ability to appreciate, to taste and see that the goodness we experience comes from him. Jesus, again, was confronted a lot when he did things in an unorthodox way. The story of Zacchaeus, walking along, he wanted to see Jesus. There were all these crowds. Zacchaeus was short. That's what he's remembered for, among other things. But he's like, I'm going to climb up this tree. I'm going to look at Jesus. And Jesus says, hey, I see you. Why don't you come down? I'll come be a guest at your house. What did the people in the crowd say about that? Were they like, cool, you'll have a great time? They said, nope. Why would he go to Zacchaeus' house? Grumble, grumble, grumble. And Jesus does it. Zacchaeus' life is changed. 
they, uh, some of John's disciples go to Jesus and they're like, hey, John's disciples are fasting and your disciples aren't fasting. They should be fasting. Why aren't they doing that? How come they're not as religious as these other guys? And Jesus says, there's a time for fasting, but it's not now. He says, you don't fast on the wedding day. You don't fast when the bridegroom is with you. That's a time for feasting. That's a time for celebrating. There will come a time later and there will be fasting, but, but not now. I wonder if those disciples of John were also virtue signaling and going like, no, 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 like this is the right way to do it. And Jesus says, hmm, you're onto something, but you're missing it. And he tells them later on, the Sabbath is made for man. It's supposed to bless you. It's not man to abide by the Sabbath rules, to keep the Sabbath going for the sake of the Sabbath. This is all just kind of a jumble of ideas. But what does this mean in our lives? What does this have to do with our cup of coffee and our tea breaks that we take? To avoid going to the extremes, too much pleasure, chasing pleasure, making an idol of pleasure, or renouncing pleasure altogether, pointing fingers at others when we think that they're going out of the bounds of where they should be, right in the middle and where the gospel lives in a way that honors God, I think, is noticing God getting better at taking these times like we do in here where we look at the cross and we sing songs of praise and we listen to these beautiful compositions of music and we go, ah, these songs just lift up into the heavens and remind us of the heavenly good God. What if we take those moments into our week? What if every time you have a cup of coffee, a moment of silence, and you go, ooh, there's a reason I like coffee and not tea? Or if you're a tea person, ah, I love this cup of coffee. I love the way the mug feels in my hand. I love the warmth. I love the smell. I love the taste. I love the silence. And there's this time to take a break and enjoy my tea in my chair. What if that was a cue for you to go, praise God. This is good. and It's good that I can appreciate this. And it all comes from a good God. Every perfect gift uh, comes from above, coming down from the Father of heavenly lights, James tells us. Every good and perfect gift comes from God. Even our tea, our moments. Even taking a little bite of chocolate and going, oh, that is good. I'm not just praising God with my voice, praising God with my taste buds. Ah, the sweetness of this chocolate is like the sweetness of salvation, the goodness that I have in Christ. I really think that's what Rich Dog was trying to do on that Wednesday night. He was new to church. He was new to Jesus. He was a new Christian. And he said, The best way I know how to express it is loud music, salty Doritos, sweet tasting Diet Coke. Was it Pepsi? I think it was Pepsi. This is how I want to express my joy of being in Christ. What if we did that in these moments of our day, these moments of pleasure? I think too often we miss it. Or too often we say, I'm going to appreciate, I'm going to notice God when I'm in the church building. Or when I'm reading my Bible or during my quiet time, or those are good times to do that, and they're built into the rhythms of our lives. What if we increased the number of times that we just say, oh, God is good because of that sunset, because of that chocolate, because of that cup of tea? I saw a news report recently uh, on the Tesla Cybertruck. If you haven't seen the Tesla Cybertruck, it looks like that. This is not a joke. This is not... (laughs) <laughs> from a sci-fi movie. This is what Tesla decided uh, a truck should look like. Uh, I don't know exactly how much it costs, but I guess it's not far from $106,000. <laughs> this is what Tesla is. I, I, there's a couple of them in Livermore. I've seen them at stoplights. I've seen them in the wild, and I'm like, whoa, it really gets your attention. It's weird. It's bizarre. There's a lot of controversy. Some people are saying they're neat. They're great. Some people are saying, wow, swing and a miss, Elon Musk. No one's going to buy that. It's not going to, anyway, you can feel the way you want to feel about the Cybertruck. But when it was new, I saw a news report of this reporter who got his hands on one, was driving it and doing a review, and he drove it out to this cliff, this beachside cliff, like a public parking area, and he parked it there. And it was like 4 or 5 p.m. All these people who were there got out their phones and did like you would imagine. Like, whoa, I don't, okay, uh, Maybe that's really cool, or maybe that's really ugly, and maybe that's silly. But in this news report, you have all these people crowding around the Tesla Cybertruck, and a lot of them were 
ragging on it, saying, this is just ugly. Look at this ugly thing. And behind them, the gorgeous sunset. Beautiful view, casting shadows. It was like that moment when I was a student at Pepperdine. They would have stopped them and gone like, oh, okay, there is something beautiful that is beyond us. But instead, everybody was focused on this. I think that's us sometimes in our lives. There's potential for us to praise God and notice his beauty and just savor the good small moments and say, yes, God, you are good. And oh, yes, I love being in Christ because there's freedom and there's joy. But we're focused on the goofy looking cyber truck. We're focused on what's wrong in the world. We're looking for something to make a snide comment about, to rag on, and we miss it. That's what the, the attaching the beauty of God, the gift of pleasure in its proper place, can remind us of God's goodness. I was in Nashville several years ago with some friends of mine, and we were at a, a restaurant that somebody had chosen because the chef there was a very, very good chef. Like, they'd written articles about this chef, and like, the food's going to be really good. So we went. We couldn't get a table. It was so crowded, so we had to sit at the bar. So we're all just, like, sitting in a row, and we ordered an appetizer that I never would have ordered. It was, like, charred pork belly with some kind of weird side that I didn't recognize. I was like, I don't know. And it was expensive. It was more than I wanted to spend, but someone was like, oh, I'll order it. We'll all, we'll all kind of share it. And I ate it, and it was good. It was like, it was very good, actually. But what stands out to me about this moment is my buddy Tommy was sitting at the chair next to me. He was the one who knew about the restaurant. He was the one who was really into good food, and he's the one who ordered it for all of us. He took a bite of this salty, perfectly prepared pork belly. And I, I, I ate it, and Kyle ate it, and we were all like, oh, it's pretty good. But we look over at Tommy, and he's doing this. Mm. And then we see him do this. I thought it was weird. I say to Kyle, what is, what is he doing? And, and Kyle says, oh, he's doing that thing where he worships with food. And I was like, what? I, I, don't, I don't know what that is. And, and Tommy explains afterward. He's, he's like, I'm taking a moment to appreciate God because of this gift of something that just tastes good. And I'm giving glory to God. I'm taking a moment to say, God, you are good. This is good, and it's a reflection that you are good. And I went, hmm, okay. So now I know that that's a thing. And you might hear that and go, that's not a thing for me. I wouldn't do that in a restaurant. I don't know that I would even do that in private. But what if you did? If you think about church history and some of the songs that we still sing today or some of the works of art that were made that were commissioned by the church or cathedrals that were built, you might think, hmm, you know what? A lot of money was wasted on extravagant, showy things. And maybe you're right. Maybe you can make a case for that. But the reason these things were done is to direct people's attention toward God. You study cathedrals. There's this... They're designed in a way to move your eyes upward, to look through a stained glass window, the refracted light, the acoustics. So when the choir sings, oh Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name, how excellent your holy name in all the earth, it goes up and it rings out and it reminds us, choirs of angels that we see in Revelation, just praising the Lamb and saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. It was done for a purpose. It's supposed to draw your attention toward God. And if a pork belly can do that, if a cup of tea, a cup of coffee can do that, if a moment of savoring in your life can do that, then I think that increases our capacity for joy, for celebration, and for worship. And maybe a helpful word that we can attach to these moments is a word that we already know and that we already use, and it's the word amen. Turn to somebody next to you and say amen. Okay. What does amen mean? Lots, yeah, okay, lots of different answers. What, is, what does the word amen mean? I grew up in church, so if you ask me as a kid, amen means end of prayer, right? Talk to you later, God. That's it for now. And that's kind of how we use it, and that's, that's fine. Uh, it's a transliteration of a Greek word, amen, very similar to amen. And a lot of times in the Gospels, 
Jesus' teaching statements will begin with amen, amen, epo, epo, uh, whatever it is in Greek. Truly, truly, I say to you is the translation in English. Amen, amen. Two amens. So you know, it's not just truly, I say to you. I'm truly, I'm telling you the truth. It's there's two of them. So that's emphasis. Very truly, I say to you. This is important. Put it in your pocket. Hold on to this. Amen means truly. So when we end our prayers, it's not just the prayer stops. I'm going to go back to my secular life. I'll see you next Sunday, God. It's the things we ask, the things that we pray, the praises we gave are true. Amen. And when someone else prays and you say amen to that, means like, yes, there's truth in what we just prayed. Truly. Amen. So Tommy eating the pork belly was going, hmm. Amen. It's truly good because of God's truth and goodness. So I wonder if next time you have your cup of coffee and you just, oh, it's the perfect roast. It's the perfect amount of cream or sugar. The perfect peace in a busy day. You can go, oh, amen. Amen to the goodness of God. I want you to try that. Take that into your week with you. The goodness of the salvation that we have in Jesus. I want st- I'm going to stop. Uh, Phil's going to come up here in a moment and we're going to share some prayer requests and lift up each other in prayer. And at the end of it, I'm sure we're going to say, Amen to the power and the goodness of God and the care that we expect and know that he's going to provide. So that's coming. But in between now and then, I want to invite you all to stand with me if it's not going to hurt you or be inconvenient for you. Stand with me, and we are going to praise God with a song that's a little extravagant, that's designed to be aesthetically pleasing, that's designed to to stir something within us that says, man, I am appreciating this beauty. This beauty comes from God. And this song happens to be about God and how glorious and how excellent is his name. You might have sung this growing up. You might have sung this uh, in the past. But if you know it, you can sing along. In fact, I encourage you to sing along. But if you don't, the words are going to be up on the screen. But it's it's kind of complicated. It's, it's, it was arranged with care and precision by somebody who knows about music and For my money, it's maybe the most beautiful song that we have in the Christian hymnal. So if you don't know it, you can just listen. You can just enjoy it. And the song ends with saying, amen, truly God is good. And then, amen, truly God is good. And then a third time, amen. These are words of praise lifting up the good God, reminding us that God's goodness is seen all around us. So go ahead and cue that song. We're going to... thy name. How excellent is thy name in all the earth. Who has set thy glory above the heavens will praise thy holy name forever, evermore.
All right, you can go ahead and be seated. If you're out of breath, you might need to be so. That was a beautiful song. I'm not sure I've heard that one before. Oh my gosh, wow. I know, can you believe that? I'm not so sure I've heard that one before, or done that one before. So, but then again, I remember, I forget a lot of stuff nowadays, so who knows. So, good morning. For those who don't know me, I'm Phil Weiss. I'm one of the folks, uh, one of the men here uh, honored to serve as an elder here. First of all, I want to thank all of our visitors for being here today. Um, really appreciate all of you being here. If you didn't get an opportunity, please fill out one of those cards that are in the bins right in front of you and hand that to me and or Jacob or Darren right over there. Any one of us would be happy to do that. Oh, they look just like this. So, um, this is the opportunity for us to be able to uh, pray for one another. Um, first of all, I want to say uh, prayers for all the people who are online this morning. So I know who is online this morning based on that. By the way, this is one of those things that I do. If you're ever online, I try to, even though I'm here, I try to get online and I try to say good morning to everybody who's joining us that way as well. So I know Laura Ranieri is online. Marsha Best is there. John Rogers is online with us today. And so I'll talk about John in just a minute. And Wade and Sylvia, of course, join us every single week online. Um, I haven't seen Arinda join, uh, say she's online, but I'm hoping she's there as well. So, um, and who else is there? Marsha Best and Roger Richardson is online with us today. So I want to say welcome to all of you as well. So we have a number of uh, opportunities for us to be able to pray for one another. Uh, I'm going to start off with just a couple of blessings here. Um, John Rogers said that his surgery went well, so he's back at home. And so um, he also said, from what I understand, is that he's cool with visits. Just call him first, okay? Call or text him on the front end. So, you know, John, he loves to call us. We should call him. And um, a lot of you had the opportunity to sign his uh, card, which was kind of unique. Uh, Dave, uh, Dave had to go, I believe. Oh, Dave is still here. Great. So anyways, so what's that? Yep. Yep. So Dave will pick that up and go. So thank you for doing that. It's something fun for for John and useful for him as well. So we definitely want to continue to pray for him as he's recovering. I also want to say happy birthday to somebody in the room. Judy Pemberton. I know your daughter totally ratted you out on Facebook yesterday. So and she also said how old you are, I'm not doing that. So that's up to you, but happy birthday, Judy. So um, definitely wanna do that, and then Judy's giving me the face over there, but that's okay, Judy, we love you anyway. <laughs> I've seen that face from your daughter too. <laughs> so, um, so some other things, um, let's see here. We were praying last week for Kate Miller, um, Matt's daughter-in-law, and so she is still continuing um, to recover, and the baby is still doing well as well. Um, let's see here. We also had uh, Brenda Crow, who we were praying for and recovering from. She's recovering from her shoulder surgery, and so we want to continue to pray for her. That was a blessing to hear that that had all happened as well. Um, Let's see here. I want to make sure that I get a few other ones in here. So um, other people that we want to pray for, we want to continue to pray for Sylvia Skinner. She's still having real challenges with her immunotherapy and uh, the, 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 the treatments that she's having. So she's had a number of different doctor's visits this week, and um, uh, Wade gave us a, a, a detailed description that we'll be able to put out in the, um, in the um, email that comes out later this week. Um, hold on a second here. I want to make sure that I cover everything here. Um, let's see. We talked about Brenda as well. Uh, Babs uh, has been asking us, asked us to pray for Montrell, who is working on, you know, he had, they had the fire, and they had lost, you know, so many things in that fire. So we want to continue to pray for him and his family. She also asked us to pray for her daughter-in-law's three-year-old cousin, Arrow, who's receiving treatment for leukemia. And so a um, little three-year-old, but unfortunately she can't walk anymore. So that's a real challenge for her. Um, also, speaking of cancer patients, we want to continue to pray for Michelle Brecht. We want to continue to pray for Billy Hunt. 
We want to continue to pay for Orinda. She's sorry she wasn't able to be here today. She was feeling really good yesterday. Uh, today, not so good. So um, we start another round of chemo with her tomorrow. Um, we also want to pray for other people who have aren't able to be here with us today as well. Um, oh, I'm sorry, uh, Michelle Brecht, of course, and her continuing uh, cancer treatments. Uh, I know Marcy wasn't able to be here today, and so we want to continue to pray for Marcy Richardson um, as well. Let's see here. Um, oh, so we want to continue to pray for the McCrandles and uh, Sandra and a lot of the eye things that she has going on. So uh, we want to pray for them. We want to continue to pray for Amanda's grandma Rose and her continuing challenges with her health as well. Let's see here, Val Moniz, we want to continue to pray for her as well with the, um, the challenges she's having with her feet. Making sure I have everybody. There's a lot of things to cover. And if I've forgotten something, I'll ask your forgiveness now because there's a lot here. So I want to make, I'm doing my best to make sure that we have everybody here. Um, couple things. Um, I know for um, next week, I will not be here. I'll be on travel. I'll be up in the great state of Washington um, at the Hanford Nuclear Reservation. So I'll be uh, up there. I know uh, I talked with, uh, the reason I know Ken's traveling, Ken's traveling next week because um, I asked him, said, hey, who can do prayers for next week? He said, I'm traveling. So Matt's going to do them for me next week. So appreciate all of that. Um, you know, we are truly a family here and try to, be, you know, and want to help and support one another. Uh, speaking of supporting one another as well, is that I know that we still need some teachers for April, so we want to continue not just to pray about that, but to actually raise your hand and be the teacher for April. Um, so that is something that, you know, uh, you know, Jacob's been talking about, you know, this, the, the sermon series that he's been doing lately, and I think it's just so amazing because there's so many practical, I can use this every day of the week things that we've had into these. So it's not just a matter of praying, but there's also actions for us as well. Um, one other thing that I want to do uh, before we pray for all of these things is also mention that Easter weekend is coming up. So believe it or not, it's only in two more weeks. Oh, and congratulations, all of you who made it on time today, right? Set the clocks ahead. All right, so now we'll have to pray for our bodies to adjust as the week goes along. But I love it being later. I don't know about you. That is a huge blessing for me. Um, but also Easter weekend, just to you know, give you a heads up, uh, Tri Valley Church is also hosting the leadership Christ for uh, leadership training for Christ convention again, and so that'll be going on that whole Easter weekend. We're going to have lots of wonderful guests and visitors, and lots of little ones running around and everything else like that. And they'll also be helping to participate. Also, I'm working with Jacob to have some of them participate in our Easter service as well. So. Um, it'll be a true blessing for us. Just want to give you a heads up for that. Something to pray for. Arin and I are still still working with that, and uh, Arinda's doing the best she can while you know in between treatments and such. So, um, but there's a wonderful group of people as a whole who are helping out with that. So, let's go ahead and I hope I have everything today. If not, I'll apologize for that. But uh, let me know later. We'll make sure that we get it on the email list. Let's pray. Dear Lord. We come to you now with prayers of blessings, of prayers of thanksgiving, and prayers of lament. We pray for our brothers and sisters, our family, our friends, who are struggling with health concerns, spiritual concerns, mental concerns, family concerns, and just personal concerns, Lord. We've mentioned a number of those here today, and we pray that you are with us and you are with them in helping support every one of them in recovering their health, helping and reach out to others, and all the things that they need, Lord. And Lord, you know what those are. Lord, we want to thank you for the blessings you've given us, the good news of Jesus Christ, 
the good news we've heard of our individuals who are recovering from surgery, recovering from challenges. And Lord, may we praise you for those answered prayers. Lord, as we continue to go throughout this week, be with each one of us and help us to be able to help each other as a family. Lord, you've given us so many examples of what Jesus did when he was on this earth, and we pray that we can continue to remember those and to live out our lives here as Jesus did, with love, with boldness, with passion, with thanksgiving, and with wisdom. Lord, thank you for allowing us all to be a family for today's worship together with one another. For those who've joined us online, for our visitors, and for people who've attended here for a long time, Lord, thank you for all of them and be with each and every single one of us. And Lord, as we talked about the word amen, it means so much more to us if we really understand its meaning. So, Lord, it's this prayer that we offer to you through your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. So, I, amen. Amen. We say it more often. It definitely means something different. What I'd like to leave you today is I'd like to leave you with uh, um, a verse that I left with you a little longer, but a little while ago, but I think... Uh, it, it, it certainly applies today when we are thinking and praying for others. In Psalms 55, verses 22 and 23, starts in um, 20, verse 22. Cast your cares on the Lord and he will sustain you. He will never let the righteous be shaken. But you, God, will bring down the wicked into the pit of decay. The blessed, thirsty, and deceitful will not live out half their days. But as for me, I trust in you. So as we go throughout this week, let's trust in God in the things that we do, the things that we say, and how we support with one another. Amen.